Welcome to our Sound for Video session today, everybody. Glad to have you here and hope everyone out there is doing well. We have a special guest with us here today, Mr. Michael Wynn. Michael, thanks for joining. Hey, hey, thanks for having me, Curtis. Great to see everybody. <laughs> Great to and, be uh, here. And, yeah. and, and if I don't, I just want to uh, say really quickly, I love the music that you got going on when we got started there. I was getting me inspired. Okay, <laughs> good. Um, you've got some, uh, if, if you don't mind, we you've got some some stuff in the background there. Tell us about uh, what we're looking at there. Is that your cart? No, this is green screen right here. Okay. So <laughs> really I'm in my grandmother's basement where I live. But um, <laughs> <laughs> No, this is, uh, this is my uh, main cart that I bring to set. And, mm -hmm. um, and then back behind there, if I... I'm kind of is my follow cart. So this is my my workshop where I maintain and get ready, do prep and stuff like that for the different types of jobs that I do. Very good. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, the uh, you bought the Cantar that, which is what we're seeing there in the background on the cart, uh, just oh, yeah. before the pandemic hit. You've but you've had a chance to actually use it in a production now, yeah. I did. I did. I just finished three weeks on a feature and um, I'm in love. It was just what a pleasure <laughs> it was. It was just really, you know, um, yeah, you know, I don't even know where to begin on that. But yeah, definitely a huge uh, Aton digital fan and their product. So excellent. Good. Well, we'll, we'll uh, maybe come back to that a little bit more detail. Yeah. A little later yeah. on. Um, all right. Let's um, we're going to go ahead and take a look at our agenda here real quick. And let's see. So first of all, for those that had not heard DaVinci Resolve, um, new version, uh, at least a beta version, 17. And uh, if we take a look here, I'm not going to obviously read through all of this, but man, there were a ton of new features across the board, but he, these are just the Fairlight features right here. So the audio, the DAW portion of DaVinci Resolve and uh, lots of exciting things there. So we're obviously not going to have time to cover all of this here. But um, some interesting things that kind of caught my eye are sort of um, and there's an offline clip based audio loudness analyzer that looks interesting. Um, just a lot of little kind of productivity tools, kind of shortcuts and, and easier ways to work. Some additional Dolby Atmos stuff and uh, just some really interesting things. So we will uh, we'll come back to that in the future. I do have a project coming up that doesn't have a really kind of tight deadline. And so I'm... I haven't decided for sure, but I might, <laughs> might install the beta and work on it in that uh, only because we don't have a deadline on it, but um, looking forward to that. So some good news there. So if you are into to testing beta software, then this might be a good choice. If not, I, you might want to hold off for a little bit. So Michael, um, tell me a little bit about, you do po a little bit of post and when you do, you're typically in Pro Tools, is that right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, I started using Pro Tools in 99 so with okay. the digi digi design 001 which is really the product that brought the you know pro tools into the home studio stuff mm -hmm. but um yeah so i've just kind of stuck with it it's you know once you learn something you just tend to just keep going that way and um i just it has everything that i want right now i'm using pro tools ultimate Okay. And, uh, you know, in most of my work these days, Curtis is all in production. Um, so I have the studio, which some of you guys have probably seen because I do a lot of live streams from the studio. And, um, you know, I hope to start mixing. You said you had a project and I was looking at um, the Atmos uh, feature in Fairlight. That's I would love to mix in Atmos sometimes um, and learn more about that. I got to experience it at an NAB, I, I guess, like three years ago or whatever. Mm -hmm. It was pretty mm -hmm. Did you see that when you were there, that booth where you could sit down and listen to the yeah. Atmos and all that? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. It's so impressive. Yeah. yeah. What they can do with mm -hmm. that. Um, or what it, what we can do with that, really. The, having a, an Atmos mixing room, though, that's that's another, that that's a pretty substantial undertaking. <laughs> well, as far as I, under, you know, as far as I, my limited understanding of it is that you can do what are called like plants or remotes. I don't know what the technical term is for each Atmos speaker, but it basically expands on the 5.1 or 7.1 listening experience 
and basically adds a height to what it is that you hear. So it'll, it allows you to hear not only around, you know, in a 360, but also uh, from vertically as well. So I think you could you could do Atmos and literally just have two plants. So if you already have like a, you know, like my room is 5-1 system. And um, so my guess with my limited knowledge of Atmos is that I could add two remotes maybe in the ceiling and um, just, you know, send some signal to it from the audio interface and have an Atmos set up. Gotcha. Yep. I just don't know if those remotes are also full range. So like in a five, one system, for instance, you have to have what's called base management. So mm -hmm. the, the subwoofer that I use is a Genelec sub and it actually has five outputs. So what you do is you run in and out of the sub. So the rears actually are full range because in a theater, it, you're, you're going to have full range speakers. So if you use a sub that just has the two in, two out, like you see for a lot of music mixing, mm -hmm. then any of that information that's being sent to those rears, you're not going to hear. So you're going to be in for a big surprise if, if that goes to a theater. Right. <laughs> yep. Cool. Good stuff. All right. Uh, let's let's uh, go back to our agenda. I think we'll just a couple more things to cover here, and then we're going to jump into our topics. Um Another thing that Lloyd sent over. Thanks, Lloyd, um, who is, I just saw Lloyd, him in Lloyd the Puckett. chat. Yep. Love He's Lloyd. <laughs> uh, Lloyd sent over a link. It's down in the description below. So if you were ever curious and you didn't really have the opportunity to do something like this yourself, but um, or you're preparing for a project, there is a site where they actually, they, they basically took an AB pair of stereo microphones in a concert hall, put some... Mm -hmm. um, various orchestral instruments and um, you know artists to play them and they move the mics into various positions and they have these recordings where you can listen to the mics in each of the different positions to see how it affects the overall timbre of what you're capturing and it's really really interesting so definitely worth taking wow. a look if if that's something you've ever considered obviously it's a starting point you're going to have to tune that for whatever you know particular recording space that you're in but Really, really fascinating. I haven't had a chance to listen to all of it, but um, the the difference between the different mic positions is really kind of um, eye opening, ear opening, eye opening, something, <laughs> something like that. Um, so that was yeah. pretty interesting. All right, probably um, first ear opening, then eye opening. Then after eye the opening. Ears receive it. Right, yeah, got it. <laughs> Little each there. Um, next up, we've got uh, a question that we've had, and and actually the the reason that we brought you over here uh, for today's session in particular, Michael, uh, other than mm -hmm. the fact that we love having you on, and it's always good to talk. <laughs> um, it's to squeeze me for knowledge. <laughs> yes, yeah, to squeeze some knowledge yeah. out of you. Um, so yeah. a, a concept came up that we we wondered if you would talk about a little bit, and the and the the, the topic is intermodulation, and mm -hmm. I wondered if you could spend a couple minutes just talking about a what that is. And B, you know, why it matters to us in the context of using wireless microphones and what mm -hmm. we can, you know, how, how it guides how we work with wireless microphones. Certainly, certainly. So, I mean, let me first start off by saying, Curtis, that, you know, in my workflow, I'm using, you know, typically like here on this cart, there's 12 channels of wireless and it's very common like on a TV show or something, you use all 12 of those channels. And then you have IFBs and also, uh, which are additional transmitter plus, you know, multiple receivers. And then you can have comm systems as well um, for communications. And the list goes on and on of all the different wireless activity that can happen on a film set. And then you've got uh, comm systems for, you know, techno crane operators. You've got all of the wirelesses that's happening on set because a lot of the, you know, the, the lighting systems that were DMX systems are now wireless and there's just this field of wireless everywhere. So we're seeing this, this noise floor because, you know, no matter what frequency something's at, it, the noise floor can just rise, uh, meaning that you see a higher noise floor, which means that there's less threshold for you to put your wireless. So, you know, the first part really is is finding available frequencies um, before you even think about intermodulation. You got to think about where 
where can my wireless live on the RF landscape? And to do that depends upon, well, the type of wireless system that you're using, um, how many brands are you using, and which uh, frequency scans do you have available? So mine, for instance, I use primary electrosonics, not all electrosonics, but most of all my talent and IFBs are electrosonics. And I will scan those systems using Wireless Designer, which is a software that will take my LPDAs or whatever I'm using, and it scans the full frequency all the way down uh, from 470 megahertz up to 608. And, and then I find where that wireless should live. Now, intermodulation is best described as if you could take, if you have two wireless operating on a, a film set, and, and it only takes two. What happens is, is that you have a third frequency that, uh, or two additional frequencies that are uh, transmission intermodulation that are created by operating those two wireless. And in order to figure out what that is, so if you have one at 500 and say one at 600, there is math for it. So if, if you wanted to find out what that third frequency would be is you would have to double the 500, which is a thousand and multiply, uh, or, and then subtract the 600, which then would make your uh, modulation frequency 400 megahertz, which is a third order intermodulation. And then if you take the 600 and double it and 1200 and mul and subtract the 500, then you have also the 700 megahertz. So once you get into, there are other types of third order uh, intermodulations that when you put a third wireless uh, transmitter in that generate a three or four more frequencies. So I by no means am doing any of that math on set, but what, what I'm doing is using a scanning software is I'm dodging these intermod uh, created frequencies and third order are the most prominent then you have fifth order seventh order i believe there's a ninth order and your software will tell you specifically where these are so once i scan then i find myself just kind of moving and dancing around these frequencies and another way to describe what intermodulation is is if it sounds confusing is so if you take the two wireless transmit transmitted channels you're basically going to have two third orders that develop and what you're doing is you're trying to not be where those intermod frequencies are and another way to understand it is like if you take two piano notes for instance on a piano and play them together you're also going to have harmonics like third order harmonics fifth order harmonics for those of you who come from music background and you can actually hear those fundamental harmonic frequencies it's kind of like a tapping of a, a guitar string on the 12th fret. Mm -hmm. So it, hopefully that explains like what it is. And really what you're doing is you're just avoiding it. And there are another thing I want to say about it is, um, you know, a lot of transmitters have groups. I don't know if you guys have seen that, but like you'll have group A or B or C or electrosonics has groups, or I know I have some Sony UWPD 11s that also have groups. Anything inside of those groups is actually intermod free. Um, so you don't have to have software per se. You can simply run in groups, but it gets dicey because you got to also make sure those frequencies you're, you're choosing inside of those groups are also clear frequencies that don't already have too much of an RF noise floor in it. So hopefully, does that explain it, Curtis, or is that like just confuse everyone further? Yeah, no, I think that that does help. And I think we can probably demonstrate that. In fact, um, that'll be part of the course that we're working on here is we'll talk about intermodulation and give some samples and some demonstrations yeah. of how that, you know, how that works and how you avoid those types oh, of yeah. things. Oh, so. yeah. Like I was on set, like to give you an example, and that, uh, you know, where I was scanning on wireless designer and for some reason the noise floor was really high that day. And I don't know if it was because of the direction of where the LPDAs were pointed because that can... And that stands for log periodic dipole array guys, shark fin antennas. They, uh, and I had to adjust a wireless designer wouldn't auto coordinate the frequencies because some softwares, 
uh, Sure has them, Electro has them, Sony, everyone has their different versions of coordination softwares. And there are also some more advanced softwares uh, that professionals use for like large venues where they have hundreds and hundreds of wireless. I mean, that th that's what those guys do specifically. It's just, I believe that's like a career is RF <laughs> coordination. You can do yeah. just, really, that's like a job. Broad I mean, like that's Broadway, how, yeah. Yeah, that's how technical it gets. But um, so like if you're working on a an event, like the Super Bowl, let's say came to Atlanta and I was doing some work around the Super Bowl. I didn't have to do any of that because I wasn't allowed to do anything. They gave me my frequencies, Curtis. So mm -hmm. I just had to say, this is what I have. And they said, these are your assigned frequencies. You had tape on it and you could not do anything except that. So there was, it was great because I didn't have to figure anything out. <laughs> um, yeah. So, you know, so there's, um, there was a point there and I completely lost it. There was something else, but it'll come back to me later. Yeah. No, I think your point is great because I, I was talking to Alan Cavedo. I don't know if Alan is Cavedo. Is, I don't know if he's here today, but um, he was telling me he went to a Broadway show, New York, um, prior to mm -hmm. COVID. And he was saying that all he, he went and talked to the mixer for the particular show he went to. And um, evidently they have on Broadway, they actually have a coordinator that takes care of coordinating the frequencies for all of the different venues that are right all kind of packed in that same area um which is kind of interesting too kind of like that super bowl experience you were talking about where you know it's not yeah. just what they're doing on their show that matters it's what it, you know everything around them that's happening and of course you're talking manhattan and so <laughs> there's a lot of other wireless activity going on there too so yeah and and, and there's a work. and there's a lot you know the other thing to mention is, is it's not it's not something you just like figure out, you know, right. I mean, throughout the years, I've learned more and more about wireless operation and coordination. And even this year, when we were down during the pandemic, I spent a lot of time focusing and learning and on uh, speaking to different manufacturers and, and RF engineers on the topic. So there's a lot of really good content out there and as curtis mentioned we're working together on a wireless audio course that will cover this that will be excellent because you i'm always seeking out more information and more learning and 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 there's also some there was an excellent thing on the sound summit curtis did you catch that from there the there was a rf uh engineer who did a presentation on day two i think that was really, really good. That's worth checking out, guys. Yeah, um, and that's that's over yeah. on YouTube, Just right? You can, you can find that on YouTube. Yeah, yeah it's okay. on YouTube, and it's like an hour presentation, and what this guy does for his living is coordinate RF. I mean, you know, so it was really, I learned a lot by watching perfect. it, yeah. Perfect, cool. Okay, well, thank you for that. That's that's uh, perfect. Let's, um, let's jump back out and see what else we had going on on the agenda there. There we are. Okay, I did skip something here, um, and Daniel was, was good to call me out on that. <laughs> Zoom announced a, a new body pack recorder, so it's called the F2. Um, mm -hmm. I, I put in a pre-order for one this week. We'll, we will have a review when it, you know, I don't know when they're going to start shipping, but they are, uh, it's, a, it's another wide dynamic range, 32-bit float uh, body pack recorder. This one's, uh, I, I don't know how they do this, Michael, and maybe you have some insights, but I think the um, the blue there's a Bluetooth version and a non Bluetooth version. The Bluetooth version is two hundred dollars. The mm -hmm. non Bluetooth version is one hundred and fifty dollars, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah. I don't it's, know how it, how do they do that for that little money. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I, don't know. I mean, I, I read it's it's funny because you know I had an opportunity to look at some of these questions and and you know Curtis and at this I had to just research it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to look at, I'm going, what, you know, and just wrap my head around some of these new directions that you're seeing zoom and, um, tentacle is the other one, the tentacle yep. E is that right. right. And, um, and that how they're integrating time code via Bluetooth control, which we first saw from the tentacle and then the recorders mm -hmm. and, um, these body pack recorders. And, you know, I have some thoughts on it. That's for sure. You know, it's, it's, it's it's interesting you know i mean so much of this stuff has been untouchable really curtis uh these features unless you were willing to spend 
you know, 10,000 plus and just, you know, sync and all that kind of stuff. Now we're seeing this stuff kind of available for le less expensive stuff, but it does have some caveats. I mean, mm -hmm. from a workflow standpoint, you know, yes. that I definitely some holes, <laughs> yes. you know, and that's, that's not to be critical as much as it is just when I said I had some thoughts, I mean, I think the, the, the profound thing when you start looking at, Oh wow, I can do time code and I can, and I can record audio at the same time and I can use Bluetooth and I can, you know, think about how many, uh, how much technology we use that connects via Bluetooth on our phones. You know, mm -hmm. I try to avoid that as much as possible, but it is convenient when you do need to solve a problem. Usually a very, uh, you know, I, I used a Bluetooth brake controller uh, a couple days ago to control a 5,000 pound trailer, Curtis. It was on Bluetooth. <laughs> I mean, I put my life on Bluetooth, right? And um, in the life of others, right? So, uh, but but long story short, the, the point is, is that you got to be careful not to overcomplicate sound, especially on these simple setups where you got, you know, 10 Bluetooth items and eight recorders and this and that. And next thing you know, it's a cluster, mm -hmm. you know, and... Sometimes it just comes down to a boom microphone plugged into an XLR input. And, you know, these kind of features, when you start talking about time code, you're talking about multi-camera workflow. You're talking about workflows that are really going to have, they're not going to be using Panasonic GH5 just to pick on the camera that I'm using right now. It's the S, but still. Um, <laughs> but it, you know what I mean? It, it, you can't show up on a film set when they're using Alexas with this stuff. Right. You know, you, you got it. You got to think about. It. So if it's a multi-camera shoot, m you know, we need to, you know, those time code inputs are not USB, you know. So, th so there's this separation that I'm seeing, Curtis, where you got to be careful about what you spend. Because if if you're coming in and you're saying, hey, you know what, I'm going to be a one man band. I'm recording my own audio. I'm doing my own video. I don't care what the industry is doing. This is for me and my clients. And I'm going to find the value added stuff then that's a big fit. But if you're, if you're coming in saying, I'm going to have a career in sound, I want to work on film sets, I want to get the jobs and, I'm, and I want, then you got to be careful about this technology to make sure that it aligns with professional workflows. Mm -hmm. and I'm going to step off my soapbox right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let's... Uh... Let's jump in. So, so there, so there's the F two, um, <laughs> mm -hmm. and I agree. I mean, and, and the interesting thing is the the uh, gr much greater than ten thousand dollar mixer you have bef uh, behind you, the uh, seven thousand dollar mixer I've got sitting next to me. Um, neither of those do thirty two bit float. Um, no, has that lost and, you and any the, jobs? And the Zoom is only thirty two bit. Did you see that? There's no twenty four bit mode. I didn't notice that. No. It's um, in the specs. If you look okay. on the site, it says that the audio com uh, available ones is 32 bit. So unless you have a 32 bit compatible NLE, which most are, right, Curtis? Yeah. But if I give a 32 bit file to you know Joe Schmo Post down the street on a commercial I got hired for, uh -huh. you're going to get a phone call. Yeah, and it's not going to be a happy one. <laughs> it's going to be a <laughs> Get these back in 24-bit and get them over to me. Yeah, or, or hey, I tried importing these files into my, th and it's not working. What's right. going on? Oh, it's 32-bit. Yeah. How come you didn't tell us this? You know, right. oh, well, it's the latest, greatest. I don't set my game. <laughs> you don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> Just say I'll get those 24-bit files to you on a, on a link for download. In 10 exactly. Minutes, right? Yep, yep. Okay, cool. Let's, uh, let's go in and see what else we've got on our agenda here for today. Looks like oh, let's just do a like a quick overhead here on the um, the A10. I just wanted to show you. Here's a just a quick scan. No transmitters on at present. Um, this is a question that Greg had, and we'll come back and actually do a, a walkthrough of the the scan and setup. But this is this is I don't know, Michael. What's your sense on this? Is that pretty clean, or is that pretty typical? When you God, go I want to live. I want to live where you live. Exactly. <laughs> that's like the. That's a. That's a dream scan right there. What's that's interesting is I see these spikes. Yep. And I'm. I'm trying to 
to look and see, okay, that's your cursor marker for scanning. See, and then I see that spike there right above, there it is, like five, what is that? Are you running a wireless in, right now in your studio, Curtis? Uh, not that I was aware of. That's 519.300. Um, that's one of okay. my transmitters is set to that. And I think what, but it's oh, not on. Oh, you have on. the transmitter on right now. Or well, no? I didn't think I did. Um, let's let's turn them on and let's do a rescan here. Yeah, so I've got oh, one at five. Turn them on. Yeah, okay. so I've got one at five thirty dot two hundred, and I've got the other one at five nineteen point four hundred. So that's the one we're seeing here. Let's. Oh, just you're go trying to see if we see any third order pop up. Yeah, yeah. Let's rescan. Okay. Go ahead and start that scan over. Just see what we get here. Ooh, I love okay. those little portable uh, uh, pocket recorders, though, Curtis. So like, let me ask you this. So have you used them at yeah. all on set? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the pocket recorders? Mm-hmm. Um, no. I, I've used... I, I own Electrosonics PDR. Okay. Uh, which is the first generation pocket recorder. It has a timecode input um, that you can jam... But it's not like a time code crystal. They have a second version called the SPDR that's two channels. But I have the single channel version. Oh, look at that scan. And I use it for my YouTube stuff all the time because it's just literally one thing. Yeah. And, yeah, and you just press record and you go. So so there's merit to keeping things simple. And exactly. I think that's that's what I see these as. Like a documentary filmmaker or somebody who just wants to put something in somebody's pocket. Mm -hmm. that's that's a no-brainer providing the noise floor is good on this thing and it sounds good uh you know but i, I think you have some stuff on the tentacle e versus this new zoom i got some thoughts on that yeah <laughs> yeah same here we'll i think share. yeah, we'll, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to that so so give us your assessment here uh of what's happening now so i turned on two transmitters just for the record uh let me just show yeah, you and, and tell me the 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 frequent. Let me write this down, and I can tell you where the NMR, NMRs will be. Uh, hold on one second. There's what a, are the? Uh, where's the two frequencies you have? Uh, that's five nineteen point four hundred. Okay, and what's the second one? And the second one is five thirty point two hundred. Okay. So if you take uh, five nineteen point four hundred. And you double it, what do we have? Um, what is it? 519.400, right? Mm -hmm. 0.400 times 2. So we're at 1038.8. 1038.8. Mm -hmm. So put a, put a pin in that. And then we'll subtract that. We'll, we'll subtract that figure from 530.200. So 508.6. Okay, so you should have a little peak, baby peak at 508.6 is the first third order frequency. Sure enough. Yeah, so there it is. So there's also another one, and let's figure out where that should be. That's the uh, 530.200 times two. And I'm trying to do the math here. Yep, so that's 1060.4. Uh, 1060.4 minus, what was it, 519, 519 point what again, Curtis? Uh, 0.800. 0.400. Oh, okay. So uh, that'd be 541. 541, let's see if we got anything there. Sure enough, there it, is. there it is. All right. So once you add three transmitters in there, that's where my math skills just say, hey, I need software to figure okay. out. Okay, so let's do that. Okay. Let's just do it and do another scan. What, are you um, going to add a third? Okay. Yeah, let's, oh, if I have batteries, let's go see. But I think the point in being, Curtis, is then we have to add, then we have to figure out the third orders from each two with the third as well, because there's going to be new ones created 
You know what it is, Curtis? There's going to be, so you have two from two transmitters, two third orders, right? Mm -hmm. If you add three transmitters, then you also have um, two more. So you're going to have six more third order intermons. Okay, here we go. And, Hold everybody. And I'm not doing that in. math here. I refuse. <laughs> get buckled in, but look at what look at look at what we've got now. Okay. This is looking like when I tried to to do some wireless on the show floor at NAB a couple years ago, or actually about a year ago. Now keep in mind, Curtis. Keep in mind this, because those 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 peaks are pretty intense. Mm -hmm. Um. Are you at what fifty milliwatts right next to your receivers? No, I think we're we're at. Uh, let's see what I've got it set to. I think we're just at ten right now. Ten milliwatts. Okay. Yeah. Even even at ten milliwatts, point blank to your receiver front end. Yeah. Those inner mods are going to have more energy in them. So meaning that if you took those two receivers and you put them in the other room and come back, those third orders are going to look a little better. Yeah. Yep. But, because, but, I, you know, because you go ahead, Curtis. Yep. No, I, I was going to say, nevertheless, I mean, the story is pretty clear here. <laughs> More channels, yeah. you're going to get, you got, you got the inner mods and you're going to be dodging inner mods. So at what and, point... I, and I think what's, I think what's most important is that someone who's new with it, understand mm -hmm. that, oh, this exists and I right. need to learn more about it. And I need right. to make sure that my transmitter, especially my third, fourth, fifth, sixth transmitters aren't being placed in these inner mods, mm -hmm. you know, meaning you can't just do a scan and write everything down where you want to be and be done with it. You, right. you, you also have to look at where your third order and then there's fifth order, seventh order, which are not as dangerous because they're gonna, not going to be as, um, as big a peaks, meaning there's more signal to noise or carrier to noise performance ratio in those slots. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. All right. Well, um, so there's a, there's a little look at, oh, by the way, just, just so we can kind of wrap this up, I know Greg was asking about this. So, um, you know, Greg, this is, this is an example, I think, um, based on what we were seeing before, certainly with two channels, um, we were pretty well set with where we were. So I would just um, leave them where they're at. But if you were, if you were finding that those intermodulations are occurring really close to your channels, that's when you'd probably want to move things around, Michael. Is that right? Absolutely. And, and it's, it's cool. Like I use, uh, like my software is wireless designer because I use electrosonic stuff and it tells me specifically where the third orders are and I move mm -hmm. it around until it works. It's literally like a game of Tetris or something. I mean, it's, it's just slide this over here, slide this over there. And then when it gives you the all clear, then you press deploy and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, so but yeah. At what but point you still does have it... to understand it. You can't just say, oh, right. I'm just use software and I don't need to know what this is. You know, exactly. At least the fundamental knowledge. Yeah. Exactly. And, and I guess a question, like a, here's a very practical question. If, uh, at what point, when you have how many channels would you say, I can't just run and gun this anymore. I actually need to use something like Wireless Designer to figure out what we're doing here. How many well, channels? There's, a, there's, I mean, well, the, to answer the, the 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 channels part, I mean, any more than two channels. Oh, okay. Because you're not going to have intermods until you use that third channel. Right. Now, there could be other competing sources creating intermodulations, but most of that's going to show up as just noise in the RF noise floor versus, you know, specific transmis transmitter spikes like we see, you know, using wireless. Mm -hmm. So that stuff goes away on the scan, you know. Okay. And so what does that mean in practical terms? Does that mean you have a laptop on your cart there too? That you're... Uh, no, and using, uh, you, there, no it, like there's an app called Frequency Finder. Okay. Um, I think New Indian here. Let me find out who makes it. Uh, yeah, Freak Finder, F-R-E-Q Finder. And then let me show you guys. Maybe I can just put it in front of the camera here. Um, see that? Well, if I can get this to focus, here we go. There it is. See this? That's Freak Finder. Okay. And it's, you know, it's on my iPhone. And on this app, you basically can choose. It will tell you if there's a third order intermodulation. And you can change your settings 
of sensitivity. So, um, yeah, so you don't need a laptop. Obviously, that's not practical for a smaller setup. Right. You know, on, on a larger cart, maybe a laptop would be better. But see, and this is the settings I'm looking at. You got to keep in mind, this is Panasonic autofocus. Guy. <laughs> the, the, uh, the, uh, yeah, so this is the settings here, you know. So, yeah, Freak okay. Finder is a great app. I would okay. highly recommend this to your audience if they were like, oh, man, I didn't know about this Intermont thing. And I'm using, you know, four channels of wireless and I want to make sure. And it can it can mess up your range. It can it can cause all kinds of issues, you know, yep. Intermonts. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Drop dropouts. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. Makes sense. And there's and I see Alan is here now. So Alan, um, Alan and I had a little chat a few weeks ago. Um, for those that are not aware, we do have a podcast as well. The Learn Light and Sound is the name of the podcast. And Alan talked oh, a little nice. bit about the types of co jobs he does. And in fact, um, he was he was considering another uh, you know moving up to a new mixer, maybe an eight thirty three, maybe an eight eighty eight. Um, but then we talked to, you know, we had the, we had the, the kind of talk that honest friends have with each other about these types of things. <laughs> Alan is very, Alan is very knowledgeable and, he is. and he's, he is. he's been a big supporter of my channel and he, he sends, we talk messages. Yeah. Yeah. And really he's, good uh, stuff, yeah. we, we had a good talk about, okay, what kind of jobs do you really do? And, um, you know, and, and for me, for example, there are times when I am pulling out, um, you know, four channels. That's pretty, to be honest, it's kind of yeah. rare. For me, it's going to sure. almost always be one or two channels, you know, for the, certainly for the corporate video work. Once I start working on narratives, yeah. you know, or commercial pieces, sometimes we'll bump that up. And there was one where I think I had five channels going. Um, I think you're going to see more channels on your corporate stuff, Curtis. I think you're right. Cause, yeah, I think. Because I'm, I'm seeing a trend in commercials right now. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys are seeing it here who are with us um, as well, where like, like, look what we're doing right now, Curtis, right? Like with YouTube and, and that kind of stuff and the social platforms, a lot of the traditional talking head type stuff is becoming less and less um, seen. Like that's what commercials used to be. Just, hey, we have one person talking, they're in a kitchen, blum, blum, blum. And then we go over here and it's going to be this B roll. Now it's like, Hey, we've got five people driving in trucks with GoPros. We <laughs> want to live stream it all live. We need 20 wireless. And like, literally I did a spot like that for a major, uh, commercial car manufacturer. Mm -hmm. And it was like a friggin' reality TV show, Curtis. <laughs> and, 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 and me and the boom op were, were talking cause we had, three mixers on it and one poor boom op who had to do all that somehow. And, um, but anyway, he was saying everything he's been seeing lately is, is completely changing from a stylistic standpoint because they're having to compete with guys like you, Curtis, you know, on it, it's to get eyeballs on stuff these days is a lot harder than what it used to be. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting world, how things are changing. Sure. So more wireless is, I think we're going to see more and think about, it's not just, you know, what you're using. It's also, what about the lighting control systems? What about focus control systems? What about mm -hmm. all of the, we're not the only, uh, in, you know, the subset of content, you know, in audio, right. Who's developing all this amazing technology. It's happening in camera. It's happening in lighting and we have all of these toys and Hey, it's wireless, you know? Yeah. Which, yeah. which could take us down the 2.4 gigahertz non-FCC license <laughs> rabbit hole and why that can be fatal, right? Fatal very quickly, indeed. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can't tell you how many emails I've gotten of people saying, hey, I, you know, I went with your recommendation. I got the, you know, insert 2.4 gigahertz system here and I, I couldn't get it to work on set. What's going on? What are my options? And my yeah. audience, like different location, you know, different yeah. time of day, you know, it, those, are, those are your options, basically. But, 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 the, but I think the flip side is, and what it was really interesting is, is that it can go the other way too. I mean, you can show mm -hmm. up to the gig with too much tech, too much, you know, uh, you can't force feed time code on a production who doesn't want it. Right. You know, cause I mean, a, a lot of them is, you know, I've had them ask for smart slates cause they just want to look good in front of the client, you know, but 
um, when they don't even have time code going right. to the cameras. So, yeah. Do you have one of the slates with the numbers on it? Yeah, we'll have one of those. You know what I mean? Kind of like they're ordering off a menu of looking good. And, okay. Um, You're, it's yeah, in the kit absolutely. charge. I'll bring it. I'll bring, I'll bring five <laughs> of them if you want, you know, we'll put them everywhere. The, but the, but, but the interesting is, is sometimes it's just the, the, the portable field recorder yeah. in the pocket that, that, exactly. that does the trick. And, yep. and that's why I don't believe in this whole uh, superiority kind of thing. Like, you know, this gear is better than this gear. This was, eh, not really. You right. know, it, it depends on like what you're working with, you know, because some of the stuff that I use, say, on a set or you use or Alan uses or whoever might be completely unnecessary for another application. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why it's some of this new technology to me is exciting. I don't ever want to position myself where somehow it's like, oh, you know, if it's not Kantar, it's not great, you know, or something dumb like that. Because the truth is, is I mean, I, am I going to go do this? to do a review of the YouTube video and bring the Canthar X3? No. I mean, you know, maybe if I just want to be silly, you know, but you know. I'm going to bring a pocket recorder because it's right. just me, right? You know? Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's so all this new stuff to me is very, very interesting. And, and you yeah. keep me on my toes, Curtis, with this stuff because I'm like, oh, man, I'm not looking. I need to get more up on what's going on, you know? <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's jump into. I know we got some questions, and actually, some seen some questions come in the chat too. So let's kind of dive into those and see what we've got yeah, for today. It. All right. Uh, first off, uh, Hal brought an interesting one. I'm interested in what you have to say about this. Um, in film school, I was told that if you put mics too close, you will be sorry. Whenever I run lobs on people sitting next to each other, I've never seen a problem. Will I eventually be sorry about this? What do you say, Michael? Nah. You won't be sorry. Do what works. The only right. thing you have to be very mindful of is transmitters being too close at too high power. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the only thing you might be sorry about. Um, but as far as like, uh, like two transmitters that are running at 100 milliwatts down ankles of two actors hugging each other right. can create some nastiness. you know. Yeah. Um, but to go back to the mic thing, no way. Uh, you know, it's... You know, you got to put mics on the actors and it's got to work. If they're close to each other, it doesn't matter. You know, now I have run into situations where I've used one mic on one actor for both actors. Hmm. Because mm -hmm. if you're trying to mix two, you know, you can throw one out of phase and see if that works. Often that will work, you know, because the cancellation you hear is really going in and out of phase is all that is. But, right. Right. Um, but yeah, you can, you know, so hopefully that answers that question from my perspective. What do you think, Curtis? I agree. I agree. It's, um, you know, and, and if, 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 if you do have a problem in post, that's, that's what post is for. I mean, unless you're doing something live, um, and, you know, in live, I think you will see some different workflows live. Like if you're talking about electronic news gathering, that's going to be a little bit different. And usually mm -hmm. I think a lot, I don't know if it's still true, but a lot of times in uh, like an ENG crew was basically an anchor, a cameraman and a sound mm -hmm. guy. And, yeah. you know, you'd have the sound guy live mixing there if you're doing live broadcast and he would, you know, pull down the, the mic of the person, you know, fade down the mic of the person that's not talking and then fade them back up when they start talking or, you know, whatever. Um, but I think for narrative and in any any time you're going to have post, I don't see it's a problem. I think what they were trying to say in, in film school to you was, you know, you're going to get mic bleed. And if you're just going to slap that into your final piece, yeah, it's not going to sound great. But if mm -hmm. you... Um, you know, if you're going to do any sort of post, you would clean that up. You'd either you'd either automate the the faders, you'd do, you know, kind of your railroading thing where you cut out the mic of the person who's not currently talking, whatever it may be. I think that's really yeah. what they were kind of aiming at. So, well, also a lot of the live broadcast consoles have auto mix features. So if it's a live show right. and you're running into two mics too close, you know, usually the auto mix can take care of that. Exactly. That's where Dugan, mm -hmm. Dugan comes back in. Uh, oh, yeah. I think Dugan was really relatively new to the production sound mixer, but has been a long time standard for uh, live consoles and broadcasts. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. All right, Hal. Thank you for that question. We'll go to our next one here. Next from Clayton. The Zoom F2 Bluetooth ads came out to compete with the Tentacle Track E. And the videos I've seen for it thus far, they show the blue timecode generator box will work with it along with the Atomos timecode option. I'm curious if Tentacle Sync will work with it. Um, I don't know, Michael. Do you happen to know that off the top of your head? 
I don't. I, I just don't have experience. I mean, I'm still learning about those two products, Curtis. Yeah. As far as like, what do you think? Uh, same, same here. I think I, I'm doubtful that those two companies would have a motivation to kind of make those two interoperable. So I'm going to guess no. Um, and you know, what's interesting about it is the tentacle to me seems a little bit more useful for. I mean, the like the the, the time code systems. UltraSync Blue is kind of a very specialty piece um, because what it does is it, it basically can send time code to a mobile device. So if mm-hmm. you're using a, a, a ca- uh, like a phone as your camera, great. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you're using a proper, you know, a mirrorless camera or a cinema camera, no go. You, you're, you're looking at the UltraSync one at that point. So it's kind of a it's interesting. I mean, I, I know Zoom is definitely very much has their eyes aimed at a different market. I think the interesting thing about Tentacle is that they kind of straddle a couple of markets. I think That's you right. do see you do see Tentacle syncs out on professionals, you know, on, on big production sets. Um, you know, they, they, yep, yeah, especially so like especially like you know maybe uh, you know if they have like fifteen cameras or something for specialty stuff, you know, yeah. which is common. You know, yeah. like if it's a big, big thing yeah. I've seen, you know, now it's, I like that you said how it strides both sides. That's really smart, Curtis, because I think that's probably the biggest difference between Tentacle and the Zoom product is I didn't see on the Zoom uh, time code box any output, any physical uh, output that would be relevant to a professional camera. Exactly. Exactly right. Yeah. Because it's USB-C, my- right? It's USB C and yeah, and then I think there's a headphone. So how do you chip. how do you how do you lock how do you use it as a locket box on a camera then? Yeah, I don't know. Good question. Good question. Well, well, well once we get it here, we'll have another talk about this. But um, the Sync E, but the Sync E, you can't because it has a eighth inch output, right? But but I think the idea on that Zoom, I'm guessing here, is that you would plug this this blue timecode device that they have into the well no you can't do that see i know i shouldn't talk about it because i don't really know it yeah 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 it's bluetooth i think so yeah but i think it can work with the like if it can work with the time code systems um add on i think i can't what's it called atom sync that goes with the the atomos recorders the video recorders um i would wonder if it can also work with this the ultra sync one but i don't i don't know that's something we'll have to explore a little bit more and see as time. Also, by the way, Clayton says, Michael, uh, he wanted to let you know that you inspired him to daisy chain my time code from my mix pre three to my H four N to grab one more synced track. And he says, thank you. So yeah, thank you for that. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you, Clayton. I'm glad it worked out for you. Cool. All right. Next question. Uh, Lazeni, how are you doing? I'm interested in the Tascam HS P 82 field recorder, and I'm wondering if it's worth it in 2020. Do you know anything about that, Michael? It's all a personal decision, Curtis. I mean, really, you know, what kind of tools you use comes down to your budget and what it is that you want. I did look at it. Mm-hmm. Um, I've owned Tascam products. Uh, I had a, uh, a, a uh, D888. D88. D88? With, with the eight track? Uh, I don't eight at recorder? They, they were like um, D888, which was a uh, time code enabled eight uh, channel, uh, recorder that was weighed like 300 pounds. It felt like probably not that much, (laughs) but anyway, um, yeah, Tascam makes great stuff. I mean, in looking at it, it looks a little heavy, um, Mm -hmm. and big, uh, for the price point and what it does. Uh, but listen, if you go and get great sound out of something and you get excellent results, that's what it's about. No yep. one's going to come back and no one asks the Emmy award winner or Academy award winner, you know, Oh, oh wait a minute. You use that recorder. Oh, I'm sorry. We're not going to give you the award. We yeah. didn't realize you use that recorder. Let's, let's, uh, no one cares we'll about take, that. Yeah. We'll take that Oscar back now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So use what works. Like maybe you may, you know, what do you think, Curtis? Yeah. I, I'm with you on that. I think that I, and I have the same impression. It seemed like a really, a really capable, um, mixer recorder for its time. Um, but it does look extraordinarily heavy. And in fact, in the kind of the research I did on it, when I was looking at 
mixers back then, that was one of the complaints that people had. They said, basically, this is a cart recorder. It's really not a bag recorder because mm, it's just too sense. heavy, too heavy for that. Um, so that's the main thing I would I would consider is if you are planning to operate from a bag, it's going to be either you need to be big and prepared for some good workouts or yeah. um, it's, those are going to be long days, really long days. So, all right, let's go yeah. ahead and take uh, the next question. See what we got next. Next up from Nick. Um, so Nick has an interesting situation. He is primarily a photographer, but um, in working, he says in construction for the last five years, recently video work is playing more of a role. So he does monthly site visit videos for the client. And the most recent request is for interviews with the workforce on site about health and safety or other aspects of the project. For example, COVID measures. First one coming up next week, a bunch of questions to ask individual operatives on site. I'm a one-man operation in a challenging environment. Must be safely uh, mobile to get around this, the site and deal with background noise. Have to be able to carry all my gear alone and need a quick setup time for the audio. I grabbed a couple of tentacle track E's yesterday as I figured they would be perfect for this. A lot quicker and easier to set up than a field recorder like a mix pre or zoom and was thinking to use it with a DPA interview kit, the 4097, to maintain social distancing for the talent. But what about the person asking the questions? Would you angle the 4097 between the two, like a handheld mic? Put a separate lav on the interviewer? It might even be me behind the camera. Overdub the questions and post later and put some live sound in. So those are his questions. And I guess, Michael, if you were if you were going to be in that situation, how would you approach this? Wow. First of all, what, what a really interesting question you know and and i had to really think about this curtis um on how to answer this you know first of all that dpa 4097 like interview kit is looks super cool um mm -hmm. first of all that's a miniature super cardioid microphone that will run off five volt so you can use a transmitter or i think what he's saying is he would use the tentacle track e and then plug this this miniature boom, you know, DPA 4097 microphone that they created into his tentacle E, which is incredibly lightweight and very efficient. So, um, the, the, I want to answer this honestly, Curtis, this, this question and not be like, and, and, it, you know, t speak to the two parts, you know, the, the, the first part. And when I say, I want to answer it honestly is it sounds like too much. You know, if I was in this situation, which is what you asked me specifically, I would be asking for an assistant. Mm -hmm. I would not do it um, because, you know, he's a photographer. Now he's wearing the video hat. Now they want him to wear the sound hat. It's a construction site, which means they're making a lot of money. OK. Second thing is uh, it's he said is it could be a dangerous situation. You got to have eyes on what's going on around you. And if you're spending too much, he needs an audio assistant. Even if they'll just give you someone to carry stuff, to keep eyes on stuff, is the honest answer to that question is too much. The The second part, uh, from a technical standpoint, on the interview, so if he's the acting also as producer, which is another hat, mm -hmm. and is asking questions to his interviewees, you know, most of the time you don't need to record a source for that. I mean, that's not going to be, that's a very specialty situation to where, you know, uh, if in the final piece, if the director or question answerer is going to be on camera or not, you know, um, how many times have we watched a documentary and heard them ask a question without a mic? I mean, and we're talking with millions of dollars of budget and it's fine um, just to give context. But so I would not split. You can't split a miniature super cardioid between the distance between an interviewee and someone asking the questions. But I really appreciate that question. And I can tell this individual is very experienced and really does their homework. But go back to the client and tell them no and tell them <laughs> we need an additional and that's how this is going to get done. What do you think, Curtis? Yeah, I think that's a that's a good point. I mean, if, it, if you really need all of that stuff, I think, you know, you could pull it off if you and, and who knows what the budgets are here. I, I, I don't know if this is, um, you know, Nick, if you're in a situation where you're just now pitching this and you know, just getting started, but you know, yeah, I agree. I think that just for safety reasons alone, that you probably mm -hmm. need, you, you need, you need to do something needs to be done that will ensure that you're going to be safe, that the workers that you're going to be interviewing are going to be safe. 
um, it sounds like there's a potential for someone to be there to do the interviewing. And, and there's another interesting um, note that came up from Robert in the chat here, which was, you know, have the interview subject work the question into the answer. And I, I agree with that. I think that's another thing you can do. But I, I'm, I'm with you. I would be wearing one of the tentacle lavs and the, the DPA 4097 would just be for the, the person answering. But I don't see how you're going to have to be pretty creative to, to be able to do all of that on your own. I mean, how would he um, even light it, Curtis? I mean, you know what I mean? Yeah, there, I, there's just yeah. so many I'm, variables. And then a construction site, obviously, is going to be, you know, probably a lot is going to be better anyway. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. So those those are some thoughts there, Nick. And, and it, you know, it's you're probably you, you might be rubbing you're, you're scratching your head thinking well, these guys don't you don't understand all of it. <laughs> um, well, but well, yeah. well, sure. But it's it's but, still important to say, you know, because how many times, Curtis, have you been on a forum and see, you know, everyone commenting on all the impossible ways and nobody's really saying like what needs to be said? Like right. at a certain point, if if you go on and you take on too much and things don't go well, OK, then you end up looking bad. Yeah. And I have to fight this fight all the time uh, on on sets. You know, to the point of we got we two man crew. Nope, not happening. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but if yeah, it really yeah. it, but I've done one. I'll do one man band, providing it's a one man's job. And it's you know the, the, you got to understand, guys, that these producers out there, even for small, are slick, and they want to save money, and they don't care, and they know that you're passionate, and they know that you'll probably say yes. You know, if you're inexperienced, it's okay to say no. It's okay to ask for more help and more money. Yep, or or that could be that the the you know the production changes what what they're hoping to produce yeah. can change if you if they can't bend on their budgets, um, you know yeah. that then you can say look this is what I can realistically do for that price. There you, you know? go. Yeah, or, or so. yeah, I see what you're saying, Curtis. You're saying take away from their wants. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So it doesn't. I appreciate you offering, but it doesn't sound like you guys have the budget to accomplish this goal. Right. doesn't sound like you're equipped financially to be able to do what you want to accomplish. That will hit a nerve. That will. And, and also to add to that. Because they'll go, wait just... a minute, we're, we're this company. We can figure it out. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. 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 So, yeah. And I, and I think that, you know, at, at the same time that you say, okay, that's not really realistic at this price, but what we can do yeah. is such and such. And I think there that's, because then, then you're, you know, you're, you're helping them come back down to reality, but you're also offering them another option. If they, in reality, yeah. if they don't have the ability to, to flex that budget at all, then that's okay. Yeah. That's okay, but here's yeah. what we can do for the budget you have. C certainly, yeah. So. Great question. Thank you, Nick. Yeah. Sorry if we're jumping to too many conclusions, but I think it's it's just good for everyone here, I think, to hear this. Sometimes I need to hear this, you yeah. know, this same kind of thing, yeah. Agreed, agreed. Okay, next question. Thanks, Nick. Next up from Florian, uh, what wireless system should I invest in so that it stays relatively future-proof? With mobile communication, Wi-Fi, et cetera, there are fewer bands available which are free to use and free of charge. That's a tough one, Michael. That's over to you. Oh, why do I always have to go first? <laughs> the, um, what wireless system should I buy that's relatively future-proof? Um, so obviously, it sounds like they're in the market to purchase their first wireless system. Um, cause he said wireless system or group of transmitters and receivers or, you know, I would say, but just my only advice would be buy for the long term. you know, meaning that if you think your, your needs are going to grow in the next 12 months and you know that, and you can save money now and buy this system that doesn't really work for the long term, then you're going to end up spending more money for the same system that you're going to have to buy in 12 months. Do your research and learn about the technology and the systems um, and get on the, uh, you know, watch the Curtis Judd reviews. Those are really good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you don't need to be plugged, but they are Curtis. I watch yours. I mean, I'll give you an example. Like lighting is something that I try to figure out how to do because I have a YouTube channel. And um, it also helps me to learn more about lighting to work on film sets because I can understand more about what we need to ask for and so forth for, you know, getting boom and stuff like that. But I'll watch, you know, Curtis Judd's uh, reviews. Then I'll, I'll go online and I'll read reviews. Then I'll go download the manuals and I'll read the manuals. 
Um, this is what I read. I, I'm like, I literally have like no social life. I literally read manuals for fun. Um, <laughs> that's kind of like what I do on a Saturday night. But just research, 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 you know, because we can't, I can't answer that question with like, you should buy this brand or whatever yeah. without knowing like what you're doing. Because there could be some systems that are overkill for you. Uh, you got to consider like, uh, does it need to be portable or is this something you're going to put on a sound card? Is it a fixed installation? Is it a portable installation? Um, what are you going to be your needs as far as range is concerned? Is this covering multiple rooms and you're in one room? There's so many variables that go into a system design. And then also contact like a, uh, one of your trusted manufacturers, like not many. Yeah. You can call them. Uh, you know, listen, if a wireless company picks up the phone and answers questions, then, you know, you got a good wireless company. Um, yeah. if they're unavailable and it's a 1-800 number and press one, press two, press three, they're not going to be for you. The The other thing is, is that, you know, talk to your usual spus, uh, suspects, True Audio, Gotham Sound, um, B&H, maybe. Uh, you know, I'm not sure how, you know, I know they wear a lot of different hats. You know, sometimes going just to the audio stores is helpful. But I think I, that didn't even answer the question. Curtis, help me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was it. That's a good answer to the question. It's, it's a tough one to answer, to be honest, Florian. It's... Um, you know, it, it does depend on the, you know, I think 2.4 gigahertz actually is okay for some types of things. If you're doing a lot of just passion, pro self-funded passion projects, I think that's probably okay to go 2.4 gigahertz. I think, um, you know, it, once you start getting paid, that's where you probably need to you, to work on, you know, you know, probably need to work with UHF systems of some sort um, instead of the 2.4 gigahertz system. So, that's where I think you need that reliability and the flexibility to be able to adapt if you get to a situation or a, a location where you, you know, 2.4 gigahertz just isn't working. I've also had I've ha also had it work the other way. I've had it work where I couldn't get, um, you know, there was so much traffic, there was so much going on in the UHF frequencies in one case, I ended up going with a 2.4 gigahertz system and it worked, um, which is pretty rare. Yeah. But, you know, sometimes I, I still carry those road links around with me every once in a while. You know, I, they usually stay yeah. in the car, but if I've got to pull them out, at least I've got them in the car and I can go grab them. And there was yeah. one time when they saved me. So, yeah, it, it just really depends on the situation, what your budget is, what, what kind of things you're doing. Are you getting paid? You, you know, you got to figure out what your budget is and how you can fit that in. So, you know, I got an interesting email the other day. Someone who is in Japan told me, and, and I haven't verified this, but they said, there are no UHF frequencies available for um, with for use for with wireless microphones unless you have, um, you know, you have to get basically a permit to use a frequency. Is how it works there. Is what he explained to me. Um, I did not they know have to be that. Licensed to so everything to is licensed. Operate, yeah. yeah, yeah, everything has yeah. to. There's nothing like here in the U.S. We can go, you know, four seventy to six oh eight. I think it is. Um, up, up, well, well, unlicensed. technically, that's that's not true, Curtis. Technically, you have to have a Part seventy four FCC license to operate anything outside of the um, professional band. So there are consumer bands uh, reserved in the six hundred. And the, you know what it is is it's limited to transmission power. That's what it is. So oh, okay, you right. can, Curtis. You're correct, actually. But I think it's up to fifty milliwatts. Gotcha. And um, there are some bands that are off limits to non-licensed users as well. Uh, right. Like 941, for instance, is license only users. Right, right, exactly. So definitely take those into account wherever you happen to be, Florian. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Okay, let's jump to our next one. Uh, next from Edward. This is probably not known. And Michael, this was an interesting one. I'd never even considered this. When filming welders under the hood with wireless mics, how do you deal with interference caused by the arc and especially AC power? Maybe you just have uh, wire them up direct with small recorders like the new Okta, I think you meant tentacle unit using shielded mics. So yeah, if you were if you were wiring up a a welder, how would you go about doing that? You know, what's interesting is I've never heard of this interference with the arc um before but it sounds like he has a really nice solution i mean putting microphones and helmets is done often for mm -hmm. elaborate costumes and so forth on film sets but yeah i mean there's a solution if if you're having rf issues and you know for sure it's this helmet um that's causing it then 
Um, hopefully the transmitter is not in the helmet. Um, cause I, I'm just, I'm trying to understand this interference curve. So, so it's kind of hard for me to answer the question. Yeah. I think what he's talking about is, uh, EMI more likely EMI. So the AC draw for the welder is pulling oh. these massive currents. And so he's concerned about EMI. So electromagnetic okay. interference. Well, I think I just learned something. I mean, I've, I've never <laughs> mic'd up a welder before. Yeah. Um, but I think the solution is wise. I think if for some reason he has to use a wireless microphone and, and it's going inside of a welder's helmet, um, assuming that the welder's talking while the, you know, it's just, you know, I guess he's got an answer. It's, what do you think, Curtis? I just, I don't know how to answer this. Yeah, no, I think that you're just gonna have to try it and see if the, if the AC draw is, is going to create any sort of interference then be prepared have a backup so a ba like a little tentacle tracky would be a good thing to have on backup there um, and he, he did say this is probably not known so this is actually yeah. some nice information that sounds like something edward had encountered this yeah issue, could, could you know be. yeah which is could good be. intel yeah good intel so and again if you if when you do work with the wireless mic i think the the thing is you're just going to want to keep the pack and the mic as far away from that ac um cabling as possible and if you do that mm -hmm. you may be okay you might just be okay i don't know if again we don't know if you've already tried this and encountered it or if it's something you're planning to do going forward or or what, whatever but um yeah those are my thoughts there yeah have a backup plan that doesn't involve wireless <laughs> mm -hmm. if you can and then just keep that pack and that the the cable for the mic and the mic itself as far away from that ac power source and you should be should be okay by hook or by crook well not by that that, that, that doesn't really apply but <laughs> gotta have a solution sounds good I though i like that yeah. though. <laughs> all right next question next up from chris i really enjoy watching reviews on youtube and training curriculum at learn light and sound i learn a ton from both with all the available gear combinations and capabilities i started to wonder if there are any industry standards for things like microphones or if it's always left to the sound mixer to choose the right tool for the job. And maybe there's a different answer for broadcast TV versus movies. What do you say, Michael? You're gonna see common threads amongst um, sound mixers working in production, um, also microphones that are used for live, narrative, and post. So, so there are standards you're gonna see. You're gonna start to see the same names over and over again. Um, and I can't speak for live mixers or vent mixers who maybe are using packages that are supplied by production companies, et cetera, et cetera. But typically on narrative film sets, the production sound mixer, I am choosing all the microphones that we deploy on a film set. Okay. And what are, just out of curiosity, what are some of those booms that you're going to, you're going to see a lot on the narrative film sets? Um, like the Sheps, Colette, CMC. Uh, 41s, you'll see those, you'll see, uh, for interiors, a lot of, uh, what's it, you know, super cardioid, you know, microphones such as the Sennheiser MKH 50, you might see some mini super cements, which is another Sheps microphone. The DPA 4017B is another one we're seeing, um, 416 Sennheiser. Uh, just Sankin CS3E, MKH70, uh, Sennheiser, uh, just trying to, I mean, there's probably a lot I'm missing right now, but, yeah. you know, as you can see, you're hearing the word Sheps, uh, DPA, <laughs> Sennheiser. <laughs> what else, Curtis, I know I'm missing some. What else is there? There, there's, no, the, you know. Yeah, I, I have, I see a, quite a few of the, like, the Sheps, the, the, uh, what's the CMC, the, the blue shotgun microphone, um. And you, the CMIT, I think you, you actually called out the CMIT, the mini, they have a mini version now too. Yeah. So it's. Yeah. But then theater you, is going to be different, right? Sure. It, yeah. So you're going to see fact, the countrymen's like the B6s in the, you're going to see those low profile ones for, you know, Ted talks that, you know, that kind of stuff, the. The headset. So likes, it depends yeah. on the application, right? Yeah, it does. And I think in theater, what's interesting too, even on the wireless side, for example, you'll see a lot of. Yeah, like in theater, it seems like you see a lot of Shure and Sennheiser, um, but you don't see as much of that on the narrative film sets. Like on the narrative film sets, you're seeing Electro, um, you know, maybe Zaxcom, maybe uh, Wizzycom, maybe maybe Audio yeah. Limited. You know what I mean? So it's kind of funny because it's kind of very 
application. Like, sure, you're going to see more in live. Like, I mean, oh, yeah. sure is, I think, the, the largest wireless company in the world, aren't they? Curtis by leaps I, and I, bounds. Yeah, I think so. I think so. They, so. And, and, you know, they own the live market, just like Electrosonics and Zascom own the film industry market. I mean, they're, it, when I say own, they have a significant market share, right? Uh, you know, of that. And, and look, your users, they know, I'm looking at, I can see comments now with this cool new, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Ecamm thing, Curtis. It's all so look, SM58 and uh MD42i, Sankin, uh Countryman. These guys know what's up, Curtis. Yep. They've been around. They know what's out there. And and that doesn't mean those are the only microphones out there. You know, yeah. but the question was, are are there standards? Yes, yeah. there are. Of course. There are there things are. you'll see a lot of. And and how do they become standards? They've proven themselves for years meaning that you've been listening to these microphones in the movie theaters and on your TV sets for years. Yep. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Good one. Thanks for that, Chris. Next up, we have one from Etienne. Do you have any tips for monitoring multiple mics during a take? Let's say one boom, three to four lavs, and maybe a plant mic. Of course, you can individually set the level of each microphone during a potential rehearsal, but actors usually tend to be much louder when camera is rolling, and they also might vary their acting slightly. So, do you primarily focus on the boom? Do you simultaneously listen to the boom on one channel of your headphone mix uh, and mix all the other mics on the other channel, in which case you might not be able to determine which lav had a problem? Do you sequentially solo each channel and trust the boom operator for the boom mic? Do you sometimes rely on auto mix for the lavs? So let's just let's let's pause there. There's more to it than that, but let's let's see what you have to say, Michael, on that. How do you do it? I, I love this question from Etienne, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And um, because what they're really talking about is just the craft of mixing, and it's a process. That takes a long time to really get a feel how to balance multiple microphones for what I'm guessing is what they're trying to achieve is two things, a quality sound mix, you know, and also to be sure that all of the microphones are working and functioning and doing their job. Mm -hmm. And I will say that on my crews, all of my crew, whether I have a three person, four person crew or two person crew or just me, are listening to the sound mix, meaning that we're all listening to the same thing. I'm not sending the boom up, just the boom and, you know, the utility, just the wires or anything like that. And for others who do that workflow, there's nothing wrong with that because you might hear some varying things. But myself, what I was trained by my mentors in the business is everyone listens to the mix. That way we're, we're all accomplishing the same goal. And, you know, when you're blending microphones, you're really just, you're looking at the variables of how many cameras you're shooting with, what the shot looks like, and how are you going to approach it. And it's really a dance of just what is the boom going to be able to get it or not? Are we going to be able to get the, the boom microphone close enough to the actor to use that? Or am I going to need to use wires or combinations of wires in the boom? And because sometimes blending really works. Mm -hmm. So there's no direct answer to this question except you're on the right track, which is why I said I really like this question. You can absolutely blend and achieve uh, excellent results with multiple microphones. It just takes strategy, experience, and an understanding of the process. Excellent. Excellent. Now, I have to confess, Michael, I am usually operating solo. Or, or mm -hmm. I, you know, it, it certainly as a sound department, I'm the, the only guy. <laughs> Yeah. And I, I actually, um, what I typically do was I will put the boom in my right channel and I'll put all the lobs in my left channel. Um, hmm. and, and the reason I'm doing that is because I'm also booming. So I need the ability to kind of have that separation so that I feel like I'm getting, you know, th that I'm, that I'm getting my aim right. And so, on, you know, cueing is all mm -hmm. good and things of that nature. And mm -hmm. then the reason I yeah. put the boom on my right is that I, my right ear is just a little bit better at hearing, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah. just a little bit of hearing loss in the left ear. So that's how I typically it was, approach it. Was it. The, it was those speed metal days when you used to play in that speed metal band. Yeah, right. And you yeah, had you, the guitar stacks and it, <laughs> yeah, I saw some old pictures on your social that when you had long hair and tattoos, that was pretty yeah. cool, Curtis. With, with the yeah. Marshall uh, full stacks behind me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the, that, yeah, it's, Etienne, it's, it's really a matter. I think I agree with Michael. It's a matter of finding what's going to work for you. Um, 
and, and I guess she, she Michael, did say, do you sometimes rely on automix for the laughs? Yeah. So what's your take on that? Yeah. Do you? For round, I've done it for round tables before. Okay. Um, yeah. And I've done it in spots on scripted stuff, narrative stuff where I where I needed it, just in mm-hmm. like because you can automix in sections, so right. I can take, like I can deploy certain things to automix and keep my hands on others, but that's usually just for very complex setups that I I need a one off of it. And I actually got a suggestion over to sound devices on this to be able to, to enable disable as one key on a controller auto mix groups. And, you know, and, and I suggested groups because they don't have groups yet. And, you know, I, I hadn't seen it yet, but it would be really easy. It would be great to be able to say, hey, I want these four channels to auto mix just for a section. And I could enable a group like you can on a live console because mm-hmm. the... Because the, the console, the live console Dugan integration goes deeper than the production stuff, Curtis, which is very basic, like a left-right automix. But the production versions have automix grouping, like we have automix grouping on the, the X3. Um, and then you can also do on the consoles, not on the X3, you can also do what they call prioritization, which you can actually give more emphasis or less emphasis to certain tracks. Um, so there are more advanced features with an auto mixing algorithm, but mm-hmm. one of the big one was being able to disable or unable, but you know, Dugan, if it is Dugan mix, what's cool about it is it's post. So if you take down a fader, it takes it out of the group anyway, it doesn't no longer considers it because everything is all post fade calculated. Right. So it kind of in a way was takes care of itself if you work like that, but Automix is a really interesting tool. And I had like a round table that was more of a rectangle with um, 22 speakers in it, Curtis. Wow. Wow. And they had wireless for every single one. So I got another guy, me and a friend, uh, Scott Beatty, who's been on this channel before. Um, another guy here in Atlanta, real brilliant. He had them lined up. We were like making announcements. If you need to go to the restroom, please come see us. You know, it's it like, Curtis, I can't lose any of these transmitters to a toilet today, Scott. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But, you know, we're like, we wouldn't let them go to the restroom. Yeah. So once they got wired, you know, we was like treat them like a bunch of kindergartners, making them everyone go because it's the corporate ones you got to worry about because they're not used to it. So they'll just, yep. it'll flop away. Yep. But um, long story short, I did Dugan auto mixing on two sound device recorders. The, the, uh, the, the, um, well, I had, I think it was two six eight eights for that to do it. And then I linked them together to get all the tracks working. Yeah. Yeah, it worked yeah. great. Yeah, and you know, automix is scary, really, but it worked great. Yeah, yeah it is scary, and, and you gotta, <laughs> you gotta, gotta be practiced. But one of the things that is interesting too on my um, SQ5, my Allen and Heath uh, mixing, it's a, it's a, basically a live mixing console as well, a small you know desk. But it, um, it also has some other interesting features around automix, including you know you can do some high pass filtering specifically mm-hmm. for the algorithm, some some low pass filtering. Mm-hmm. Um, and there were some other kind of interesting things on it too, to kind of tune it a little bit as well, which was kind of interesting to see. So, all right. And then I think last question here from Etienne, in case you have, whoops, go back. There we go. In case you have a doubt, do you happen to listen to the sound you've just recorded between takes? For example, when the director asked to see the picture again, in other words, you just review what you've just recorded, a take you just recorded sometimes between takes. I find myself playing back when we did something cool. Like yeah. all, you know, if there's time, I'm like, oh, let's listen to that again. You know, yeah. you know, that's the only time I typically will play back. You know, I'm not usually, I can kind of tell how we did really when we were rolling. It's not really, I need to go check it, you mm-hmm. know, but like on the playback feature, I guess does give you the, combi- if, if there's a question or something that I'm not sure about, I might use playback for that. So yeah. Yeah. Same here. Same here. So if I, yeah, if I'm not, if I feel like, oh, there was that one part, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I think we're okay, but I just want to double check, you know, and I've got time then. Yeah. I'll, I'll check it too. Yeah. Yeah. Same that's thing. great. Good question. And in fact, Etienne has one more question. So let's see in what, in which cases do you use a fixed stereo couple on set in addition to the boom and the lobs? And if so, what kind of stereo technique do you generally use? ORTF mid side, is there any particular value to invest in a stereo couple just to use on set? I love Etienne's questions. Um, by the way, they're very well thought out. Um, 
so I typically don't do stereo configurations when recording dialogue because it's not, it's just not relevant. Um, right. It doesn't add any value uh, to what it is that what there were there to do. That being said, um, so we're doing you know mono recording with microphones and then a mono mix, typically in one polyphile. However, there's always a caveat. I do uh, typically do deliver sometimes stereo uh, stuff. So for film in the old days, ORTF, for instance, uh, just so you guys know what that is, that's a spaced uh, left-right pair that probably has the best stereo imaging out of any stereo configuration. The problem with ORTF is mono compatibility. So if it gets folded down to mono for any reason um, in post, which used to be a big reality for picture, then you can deal with phasing issues. And what that means is it can change a mix. So if it folds down to mono, that means the user is not going to experience the mix the same way that it was heard in the, um, the studio when they're mixing. XY, because of the locations uh, and just use of the uh, capsules, is less prone to phase interference. And so that you'll see, I did an XY configuration on my recent uh, project. And um, I think it's just a picture of the microphone and it doesn't show anything else. So I might be able to uh, show you guys a picture of it. Let me see here. So if we're doing something cool that warrants a stereo recording, that's not really dialogue, it, which is really very rare in recording dialogue, um, sometimes we'll be able to do something here. I, hold on, Curtis. I'm trying to make this work because I want to show a picture of this rig. I think it would be worth sharing. Um, ah, there we go. Because it's an XY configuration. And then uh, make sure this photo is not showing anything that you guys can't see. And it's not. And, oh boy, let's see here. I'm trying to navigate. I need to take a computer class here, I think. Okay, so if I share screen. <laughs> oh, wait, it won't let me share it. Okay, sorry, that was a waste of time. Anyway, I used a Manfrotto bar to do an XY configuration with two microphones for an exterior. I was going to show you a picture. And then MS configurations are really ideal for film sets because it's usually one. They make some excellent microphones that are like the... Um, I think the 816S, there's a stereo version of that microphone I've used. I also have an inexpensive AKG or Audio-Technica BP4070. Mm -hmm. um, and the advantage to MS is that you can change the stereo width and post. So it has more flexibility. Um, and I've delivered a lot of MS stuff to, but typically I deliver it on the back end, Curtis. I don't give it to the editors. Like I usually I'm talking to post, like having side conversations that have nothing to do with editorial. Right. Um, because it's just going to confuse them. Yep. Good. good. I, I agree. I have never done any sort of stereo recording on set when I'm in there to, to record dialogue. It's different. Of course, if I'm doing, you know, if I'm the post mixer and I'm hiring myself to do, <laughs> to do some of the yeah. other recordings, but uh, stereo ambiances are really nice too. I think that can add a lot to a, a scene. Yeah, like if it's if it's a unique location, Curtis, like mm -hmm. like if it's something I think the the thing is, A, if obviously the priority is dialogue and sometimes like if it's TV, it can move really quickly. Right. And then you start you don't want to ever do anything that's gonna take away from what's the task at hand. Right. Um but if there if you literally do have the opportunity, which you know, and it's like a, a stereo ambience in the distance or something like that that's like unique and that they were not going to be able to recreate as well as you can. That's really where it's nice to deliver that. Right. And you'll get some extra points with post. Like they'll think <laughs> you are the cat's meow. If you can do this effectively, like they go, Oh wow. But yeah. the problem is then they start asking for other stuff. Hey, do you have an MS of this and that? <laughs> no, 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 no. We don't have any time to do that. <laughs> it's a double edged sword. Indeed. It is. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, Etienne, thanks for those questions. And thanks, everyone, for the questions that were submitted ahead of time. We do have a couple of super chats. We'll go back and grab those. I realize we're over time here. Um, if you have a couple minutes, can we just grab a couple of super chat questions, Michael? Is that all right yeah, for you? Yeah, good. Let's do all it. Right. Yeah. Okay, let's do it. First up from Camille. 
Um, what do you recommend? A Sony XLR K3M or a MixPre 62 for my o- A7S 3 um, so I'll give that I, to you, Curtis. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll take that one. So the XLR K3M is a little add-on unit for the Sony A7, you know, Alpha Series cameras. It allows you to bring a couple of XLR microphones into your camera directly. So it sounds like Camille's kind of doing a run-and-gun kind of solo operator type of thing. Um, you know, I'm going to come at this with a, a confessed bias. I would probably go with a Mix Pre 3 just because it would give me additional options down the road. You know, sometimes you want to be able to have, I don't know, it's, it's a tough call. It depends on how integrated you need your rig to be. If you need, if you absolutely need that rig to be as small as possible and, um, you know, here's the, here's the Mix Pre 3. <laughs> Michael has an opinion on this too as well. But I think the advantage of the Mix Pre is that... You know, you have the analog limiters. I don't know if the Sony has that or not. Um, Sony does have some actual auto gain that actually works better than any other auto gain I've ever heard, ever, anywhere. Um, really? Yeah, I, I was, I've been surprised by some of the examples I've heard of that. So it's not perfect, but it's better. You know, auto gain is usually like the, I mean, from a sound mixer perspective, usually the, the, re- the reaction is, ah, you know, running away screaming, no, don't use auto gain. <laughs> yeah, um, turn it off. Turn it off, um, but it's actually, you know, it's not as bad as, as most of the implementations I've seen. But the nice thing about the Mix Pre is it just gives you more flexibility. So that's my biased opinion. Would it, I would probably go with the Mix Pre. Now, the 6 is a little bit bigger. If you really need to keep that rig small, the Mix Pre 3 is probably worth considering because it is yep. really small, and it's it's not too imposing. It keeps that rig at a pretty decent size. So that would be yeah, my thought. Yeah, and, and if they're using an A7S 3 they don't need a Mix Pre 6. Unless they're doing uh, Ambio, that or or if they've got you know four person somehow you know four, <laughs> that that'd be pretty rare I'd think but you know if you're doing yeah I think so too I mean for like the that. for the trade off for the weight and power requirements yeah yeah now does the six draw a lot more power than the three Curtis or no um it well it does of course but um, I haven't done any specific battery comparisons between them I'm usually again okay. I'm usually in a bag with a distribution system so it's not it's, kind of okay you know i just really for me the batteries that are attached to the mix pre itself are just bridge batteries to get me through battery changes so i got you yeah all right thanks for that camille hope that was helpful uh next up from ron uh ron says are you using any auto mix in this interview with michael i use ecamm and wonder if there's value in enabling dugan for remote interviews we're not using any sort of auto mix right now we are um you, you know you're just hearing the quality feed that Michael is sending over to me. Um, I'm coming through my Shelford channel as usual. And uh, Ecamm is just putting, putting the two of those together. So I don't know. Michael, have you ever done any remote auto mix configs? I want to do more of that. I mean, I think that's really cool. I love it when things are in the moment and you get to be creative. But, you know, yeah. um, I mean, Ron, I would say, you know, I mean, it's just, you know, Curtis and I, and just like a lot of people here and probably like yourself, just with an audio background are really, it's about getting it right in the front end, really. I mean, there's, you know, providing you got a good signal to noise, you're using the right kind of microphones and making good decisions on what your source is. It's not necessary. People are wearing headphones, uh, mute yourself yeah. when you need to cough, um, <laughs> all the, all the yeah. normal stuff you yeah. do. Yeah. Yeah. But it's interesting though, Curtis, is that it is, one thing I think that's interesting about what Ron says in this question is it's YouTube and Ecamm, for instance, uh, you know, is, is different than say like zoom, which has many built in Mm -hmm. features, you know, which I, I'm glad that this audio is not doing anything that we're in control, you know, because I wouldn't want software taking over control over, you know, or at least have the option to make sure that, you know, because I've, I've run into that with not to pick on uh, zoom, but you know, cause they're making plenty of money. I can pick on it. What I say that ain't going to affect how much money they're making. So it, there, there, there can be some, even when you turn off auto processing, that some pretty serious degradation yeah. that I hear. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. And we, we, this is the first time we've done this. So we're using Ecamm has a brand new interview feature. First time we've used it. Um, on our end, yeah. it's seeming pretty good. I don't know what. How's been your experience so far, Michael? On your end, it's great. 
I mean, it's, great. So it's cool. a lot better, I think, than you, I can see the comments. So that's nice. Yep. And um, so it's it's much more engaging to be able to so where Curtis, both Curtis and I can see the the comments rather or the questions and you're not having to read. That's the other thing is I can see what you're doing yep. on the screen, which has a lot of value. Um, right. Curtis, Curtis, guys, Curtis is the one that introduced me to, to Ecamm. So, um, really solid platform. It's been, it's been surprisingly good. Yeah. So, all right, my friends, um, it's a sad time of the week when we have to, we have to call it. It's time for everybody to move on to other things, get out there and make some good recordings. Michael, thank you again so much for, uh, sharing your time so generously with us. Appreciate that. Yeah, thank you, Curtis. I always enjoy coming on the channel and hanging out and talking shop. I really appreciate it. All right. Everyone get out there, make some great sound, and we will talk to you again next week. Take care.